You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. This is Dr. Bernadine Cruz, and you're listening to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. While being a companion animal veterinarian, I know sometimes going to see your veterinarian can be a little bit unsettling. We try not to talk in doctorese, but sometimes that happens. So stay tuned. Right after this commercial, I'll be back and tell you how to get the most out of your veterinary visits. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Welcome to Pet Planet. Here's a copy of Pet Planet Magazine, Florida's most informative and fun pet resource magazine. It features heartwarming stories and informative articles from local and national pet experts. Excellent. Pet Planet Magazine offers Operation Planet Rescue, helping rescued pets find new homes. And it's available at 500 locations in South and Central Florida and 24-7 on the Internet at PetPlanetMagazine.com. If you're out and about with your pet, you may be featured in paparazzi, candid pictures of you and your pet. For up-to-date pet-friendly events, activities, and pet-related services and products, Pet Planet Magazine is your final destination. I shall take this magazine home with me. Back to your home planet? No, to my condo in Boca. Pet Planet Magazine. Check them out at www.petplanetmagazine.com or 352-394-8578. It's out of this world. Ladies and gentlemen, Pet Life Radio proudly presents DSPN, the Dog Sports and Performance Network. Get ready to unleash the dog sports enthusiast in all of us. From ski touring and mushing to racing, agility, and competition, this is the place to learn all about the dog sports and activities that you can do with your furry best friend and canine competitor. So get ready for game time. DSPN with your host, Lori Williams. Every week, on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Well, welcome back. Again, this is Dr. Bernadine Cruz, the pet doctor. And yes, I am a pet doctor. And I know there are times when clients come in to me and are in an office call, and oftentimes they're just nervous because they're afraid I'm going to find something wrong with their pet, or their pet is ill and they're concerned. What's causing it? What can I do? There have been some studies done showing that when a person goes in to see their own doctor, they only remember about 50% of what they're told during a doctor visit. Of that 50%, only 50% of that is correct. So accurately remembering what your doctor tells you can be critical to your health as well as your pet's well-being. So what can you do to make sure that you're getting your money's worth? Well, first thing I always think is a great idea for people to do is to keep a pet health diary. You know your pet better than anyone else. So when you see changes at home, make a note of it. You may tell yourself, oh, I'll remember, when I go see my veterinarian, I'm going to tell him or her these various things that you've been noticing. But you get into that doctor office and the veterinarian starts to talk and the pet starts to wiggle and if you bring your children along, that can just add one more layer of uh, consternation, what to do. So keep a pet health diary. It can be a small little manila folder with uh, some spiral notes in there. What you want to keep track of are things that are changing. So, for instance, the appetite. Does it go up 
does it go down? You may want to make note that, oh yeah, the appetite seems to be down a bit, but I'm now feeding a different food. Your pet might not like that new food. Or you may find that uh, you have a child in the house that's in that high chair and throwing food down to the pet and the pet goes, ooh, I love this kid, because you're getting some extra treats. Well, that could cause the diet, the uh, appetite to apparently go down when in reality, maybe we're just getting a few more treats from other places or from other people. Make a note of changes in water intake. Water intake that goes up for instance, may be an indication of a pet that has diabetes. Maybe it has a little bit of a bladder infection, or maybe it's just hot. So if you notice there's been a change in water intake, also make note of what the temperature has been at the time. So really hot weather here in Southern California can cause a pet to drink more water, and it may be absolutely normal. Other things to do is to keep track of your pet's weight. We know obesity is a real problem about... Um, 80% of pets in some studies appear to be overweight. About 40% seem to be obese. So how do you know if your pet is obese? One of the easy things that you can do, because you see your pet day in and day out, and keeping track of weight changes can be difficult, maybe once a month or so. As your pet is standing up, look down at it. You want to be able to see a bit of a waistline after the rib cage. Well, where's that rib cage? If especially it's hard to tell if you have a really fluffy animal, put your hands on the side of its chest. And with a little bit of pressure, and that's the operative word, you want to be able to feel the ribs. If you're pinching an inch, yep, your pet is probably overweight. And you'll want to bring these weight changes to your veterinarian's attention. Weight that goes down, especially if you're not changing the amount of food or treats that you're giving your pet, may be an indication of some type of internal problem. Diabetes can cause weight to go down despite the fact that the pet seems to sometimes have a very good appetite. An overactive thyroid is another reason why your pet cat, in particular older cat, may be losing weight. I'll have instances where a person will bring in a cat going, wow, this older cat is just feeling good. It's running around like a kitten again. It's losing weight where before it was overweight. And I just think this is good. Well, it may be a good sign the cat has found a a new stash of catnip hiding someplace and is running around like a kitten. But too often we'll find that the thyroid is overactive. The thyroid is a gland located in your cat or dog's neck. Typically, as a dog gets older, the thyroid becomes underactive. They may start putting on weight, seem to have an oily hair coat. Uh, You may just find that the ears are extra oily. But those can be indications of a pet who has an underactive thyroid. Cats, older cats, tend to have an overactive thyroid. Overactive thyroid is called hyper thyroidism, and there's medication that can be given. There's actually a cure for it. Most of the time with hormone problems, we're able to control the problem, but not to cure. But for cats with these overactive thyroids, there are veterinary facilities that can give your cat a concentrated dose of a radioactive iodine. That iodine is absorbed by the thyroid gland and kills off these cells that are producing too much of the thyroid hormone. Needless to say, these cats are going to need to be hospitalized because though they're not glowing in the dark, their urine feces is radioactive and it must be properly controlled and disposed of. So if a kitty will be staying in the hospital for about a week, and once it goes home, it's quite safe to have around the family. So we're keeping track in your health diary of changes in appetite, water intake, weight, and even coat quality. You may find that your cat or dog's coat becomes extra oily. For a dog, again, that can be a sign of an underactive thyroid. If you're starting to see a lot of dandruff, it may be a sign that maybe there's just not enough oil in the diet. The problem that will occur with some dogs and cats when they're put on a reduced calorie food is that some of these reduced calorie foods don't have enough essential fatty acids, some omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids. And you'll find typically after about a month that your pet's coat starts to dry out. What can you do? Well, yes, you can change the diet. Another thing that you can consider doing is supplementing the diet with these omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids. Ask your veterinarian for a good supplement 
after your veterinarian has taken a look at your pet and ruled out some other underlying problems. Bowel and urinary habits. Way too often, I'll have somebody who brings in a dog or a cat who knows it's just being a bad pet. It's now defecating in the house or the cat is peeing in the corner. Well, it may be a behavioral issue. You're working too much or maybe there's cats outside that are bugging your cat and your inside cat starts to urine mark. Or it could be an indication of a bladder issue. It could be an indication of a psychological problem, basically a mental problem, such as cognitive dysfunction syndrome. Well, kind of a fancy term for saying doggy Alzheimer's or kitty Alzheimer's. They can go through many of the same changes that our humans can. And when these little animals start getting a bit older, they can get caught in a corner. You may find that their behavior changes where before maybe your cat or dog wanted to spend lots of time with you and now couldn't be bothered. Or they start to wander around the house and aimlessly wander and start having that kitty lost cry that they'll sometimes do. These are changes that should be brought to your veterinarian's attention. There is no cure for this cognitive dysfunction syndrome, but there are medications that can help, as I say, turn that light bulb back on again so your pet can be a uh, happier part of the family. You may also want to see if there's changes in the visual and hearing acuity. It seems to sometimes happen overnight. I had the same situation with my own black lab, and this was several years ago, where here I am, a veterinarian. I should be aware whether or not the hearing has changed. And the situation was, during the day when I was gone, during my older black lab, would sleep in the garage, and he had a nice little bed underneath the workbench where he and his younger counterpart, a little Pomeranian mix by the name of Juanita, would spend their days. Well, I came home one evening, and the electric garage door goes up, making its usual clatter and bang and all this noise, and the lights were on, and I could see Durham on his bed. He didn't move. Well, Juanita's up and moving around, waiting for me to drive in. Carefully drove in, and here's the noise of the car. Still, no movement from Durham. I'm going, uh-oh. Slammed the car door. Nothing. Walked over to him, and is calling his name, and his little ear is on the pavement in the garage, and still, no movement. I touch his little ear. And it's cold. I'm thinking, oh, no. He passed away in his sleep. Right about that time, he sticks his head up going, hi, you've been at work. Glad to see you home. Just freaked me out. So it can be sometimes just overnight where the dog or cat's hearing seems to go. And as they get older, they oftentimes do sleep very, very soundly. Well, believe it or not, there are hearing aids for cats and dogs, typically more dogs. Most of the time, they don't seem to tolerate them very well because there's this weird thing in their ear. So, if you think that your pet is losing its hearing, you can do a very simple, very non-scientific test. When the pet is not looking at you, you can clap your hands together or you can get some pots and pans and bang those together and see if all of a sudden the pet turns around to look at you. You may turn around and you may find that it's going to have hearing at one frequency or another. So maybe a very high-pitched noise is able to hear. Maybe stomping your feet is able to feel the vibration, not so much hear it. So if you notice these changes, bring it to your veterinarian's attention. Maybe there's just a big ball of wax in the ear. Maybe there's an ear infection. There could even be a tumor. There may be some things that your veterinarian can do. So keeping that pet health diary is very important. Bring it with you every time you see your veterinarian. And it's a good idea to have your pet seen by your veterinarian at least twice a year for a well pet checkup. Okay, so I'll take a little break here. We'll be right back. You're listening to Dr. Cruz on Pet Life Radio. This is the Pet Doctor, and we'll be right back after this short little break. Stay tuned. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. New York, the glitz, the glamour, the exciting Muttropolis, the sparkling kitty city that never sleeps. Join us each week for Pets in the City. With your host, Diane West. Celebrity pet sightings, hot events, and news and reviews with the hottest movers, shakers, and tail waggers in New York. So take a bite out of the Big Apple with Pets in the City. Every week, on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. (laughs) 
Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Okay, so you have this pet health diary. Now what are you going to do with it? Take it to your veterinarian every time you're in there for an office call. So you're in this office call. You've taken your pet health diary with you. Now, how to remember everything that your veterinarian tells you. You want to, you know, pay attention and you're trying, but sometimes we just get lost or sometimes you just don't understand. A good thing that you can do is take notes. If you don't have a notepad, ask your veterinarian for a piece of paper to take some notes. If there is a serious situation going on, maybe you need to make some decisions that you don't want to. It's an older pet. Maybe there is a condition where you may have to consider putting this pet down. Or you just have a very ill pet and you just know that you're so distraught you can't pay attention. Bring a friend along. Have that friend take the notes for you or ask questions. And you can tell your friend before you get in there what your concerns are, what you really want to find out. If you have difficulty understanding what your doctor is telling you, ask for clarification. It's nothing different than when I go and I take my car to the mechanic and they're talking about valves and lifters and things like that. I don't understand. So I don't want to sound dumb, but I have to say, okay, I'm sorry. I don't understand this. Can you explain it to me again? And sometimes I'll try one more time and it's still not working. So if it's still not working for you, Go ahead and say, draw me a picture. Sometimes we all learn in a different way, and for you, you may have to have a picture drawn for you. There's nothing wrong with that. And your veterinarian should have patience with you. If you find that you've been in the office call, you still have some questions, your veterinarian just can't spend any more time with you, say, okay, I still have questions. Can I call you later, or can you call me? Find a time that's going to be appropriate for the both of you. Or maybe there's some handouts, brochures, a video, something that you can look at, listen to, that'll help answer these questions. That can really help. Well, talking about uh, maybe emailing your veterinarian is a way to get some answers questions. Email is a great way to keep track of what's going on with your pet and asking some simple questions sometimes, making appointments. Many veterinarians have a website where you can make appointments or you can pose a question. But... It's not as good as actually going in there. If it's a simple question, go ahead. Email that to your veterinarian. But don't be surprised. Your veterinarian says, you know, there could be so many different possibilities. I really need to see your pet in an office call. You may find that you want to go to the Internet and get questions answered on the Internet. Keep in mind that there is no regulation of who posts what on an internet site. So though the internet site may look wonderful and have exactly the same problem that your pet has, what you're being answered, the questions that are being answered for you, the answers may not be medically correct. You get what you pay for and the internet is free. If there is a site that may have a veterinarian for a fee willing to answer questions for you, be a little bit leery about those sites also. The veterinarian may be a true card-carrying veterinarian, but they're unable to see your pet. They're unable to feel, touch, do all these various things, have copy of the medical records, have uh, access to the lab results. So they're sometimes willing to try, but your veterinarian is going to be the best source of information. If you want to go to a site that has some good medical information that you can trust, ask your veterinarian what they recommend. They may have some links on their website. You can always go to the American Veterinary Medical Association, and that site is avma.org. Some good information on that. Or you might try to go to your local veterinary association, state or even local, and they may have some information that can help you. So you've done all these things. You still have some questions. Your veterinarian may have told you that your pet has a serious medical condition, may want to do surgery, or may say that your pet has cancer. You just can't believe it, or you just want to make sure that you're getting that right information. Or maybe you believe your veterinarian and tells you that there is a treatment protocol that they want to do, and, oh, is that really going to be the best for your pet? It is never wrong to get a second opinion. I know there are sometimes my clients will say, oh, 
hesitantly that they want to get a second opinion. They're afraid that they're going to hurt my feelings, really. A good veterinarian is never going to have their feelings hurt if you want a second opinion. A fresh perspective is always great. Having somebody else look at the data, somebody else looking at the pet, there may be something that they've missed. Veterinary medicine, human medicine is considered an art. And why is it an art and why is it a science? Because it's something that we're always learning. We're always trying to get better. It is never totally cut and dry. So if you have a question and you want a second opinion, great time to have it done is when it's a chronic condition that it just doesn't seem to be getting better or if it's a life-threatening condition. There's a lot of ways to get to the same end point. You know, as I say, there's a lot of different ways to bake a cake. Well, there's a lot of different ways to take care of your pet. Some of the best sources for a second opinion are going to be a board-certified veterinarian, someone who's board-certified in the particular area of concern. So, for instance, if your pet is having a chronic skin problem, you'd want to see a board-certified dermatologist. Or if your pet is having seizure difficulties, a board-certified veterinary neurologist. Basically, all the same specialties that there are in human medicine, there are in veterinary medicine. How to find this person for a second opinion? Ask your primary care veterinary for suggestions. Or you can contact your local or state veterinary medical associations. How about even a state veterinary teaching hospital? Now, keep in mind there's only 28 veterinary colleges throughout the United States, so your particular state may not have a veterinary teaching hospital. You can also ask a friend or a family member. Maybe they've had a pet themselves who's had some type of orthopedic problem. Where did they go? Did they like this person? All right, so you found yourself a great source for a second opinion. How to prepare for this appointment. Ask your veterinarian for a copy of the medical records and lab work. This is very important to do. Take a copy of the x-rays. Keep in mind, you'll need to return these x-rays to your veterinarian. They are a property of the veterinary hospital, not you. Maybe they can take a, a, make a copy of it. A lot of veterinarians will now have digital x-rays, so they can just make you a CD, and your second opinion veterinarian can have these x-rays with you. You'll also want to take detailed notes that you've made of responses of your pet to medications and treatment. There are some times, however, when you don't want to take any of this information with you. You may say, okay, I just want to have a totally fresh perspective. There's nothing wrong with doing this. Keep in mind, however, that all the tests, all the diagnostics that your primary first veterinarian have performed will need to be repeated. Even it was just sometimes done a month or two ago and you take all these medical records with you, your new veterinarian, your second opinion veterinarian may want to repeat it because a lot can change in a very short amount of time. Keep in mind, one of our years is about seven pet years. So even if it was just a month ago, a lot can change in a small amount of time. Say you maybe don't want a second opinion, but you're just not really sure everything your veterinarian has told you. Sometimes preventing miscommunications is so important. Miscommunications can be a source of hurt feelings and not following through with treatments that are appropriate for your pet. So when to ask some questions, really important times, is when your pet is given medications. Ask, what's the medication for? How often am I supposed to administer it? Am I supposed to give it with food? Can it be given without food? What are some of the possible side effects that you can expect with this medication? And if you see these side effects, adverse side effects, what should you do? Should you stop for a day? Should you call the veterinarian? What should you do? And when should you start seeing some results? That's important to help prevent miscommunications. I always think it's a great idea, again, to take notes. Take notes because... We sometimes talk in terms that you don't understand. If you're taking a note, you go, wait a minute, back up, I don't understand you. Tell me that again. Use some terms that I can understand. Bring in a friend with you. Those are all important things to do. I find that one area that sometimes will lead into miscommunications is going to be charges for services rendered. I'll go in and tell a client that I need to, for instance, draw some blood work and I need to take some x-rays and then I need to give an injection or two and it has to go on with this medication and I'm thinking about possibly changing diet. 
And they keep shaking their head and going, oh, okay, okay, sure, do whatever needs to be done, doc. That's absolutely fine. Then I've done everything, then give them my charges. And it's like, wait a minute. I wasn't expecting the bill to be this high. And veterinary medicine can have a hefty price tag associated with the services. Oftentimes, we're surprised because when you and I go to our doctors, most of the time we have health insurance and you have a copay. And you think, well, you know, that wasn't bad. That office call and having all these tests done only cost me $20 or $30. That's pretty good. Well, when you look at what all the charges truly are, veterinary medicine can really be a, a deal, a great bargain, because the procedures that are done for veterinary medicine really have a much lower price tag compared to that same procedure done in human medicine. But that price tag can come with a surprise. So before any services are rendered, it's never wrong to say, you know, I definitely am going to go ahead with all this, but... I would like to have an estimate, a treatment plan of what's going to be done. So there's no surprises and there's no uh, sticker shock later on. Another good time to ask for a full treatment plan is when your pet is going to have surgery. What can you expect? How long is a pet going to be hospitalized? What are the pros and cons? What are some of the risks? That's especially important if you have an older pet. What's the recovery time? When can I take my pet home? When can it go out for a walk? Can it jump on the bed? Uh, Do I have to wear a special Elizabethan collar so it can't get to the surgery site? What kind of nursing care are you going to have to do at home? How long is it going to have to have a little R&R when it's at home? Are there any feeding changes that I'm going to need to do? What problems can be occurred when your pet has had a surgery? So pros and cons, timelines, all of these things are so important. It's always important that you and your veterinarian form a team. Together, you and your vet have your pet's best interest at heart. Sometimes you need to make some decisions that are going to be based on economics. It's a sad decision, but it's true. That's one of the reasons I'll always recommend that clients get pet insurance. There are several different companies that do provide pet insurance. Which pet insurance is going to be best for you? Talk to your veterinarian about it. Go online. Look at the various programs that are there. Some of the larger companies uh, will have services that can be rendered at any veterinary hospital at uh, in any state. So these are nice, especially if you're going to be traveling. Sometimes a program that is offered through your veterinary organization, sometimes a corporate veterinary practice, some of the larger ones throughout the United States, uh, may have a program where you purchase this and can only be used in their hospitals. It's a great savings, but if you have to go to an emergency clinic in the middle of the night, that insurance oftentimes will not be carried along with you. So ask your questions. Do your homework. You and your veterinarian make the best team to make sure that your pet experiences the best health possible for as long as possible. Well, you've been listening to Dr. Bernadine Cruz, the pet doctor on Pet Life Radio. Hopefully you've learned a little bit of how you can get the most out of your visits to your veterinarian. This goal of my particular program has always been to entertain you a little bit, to educate you, and to motivate you to be the best pet owner that you can be. If you ever have questions about your pet, the best person to ask is your primary care veterinarian. But if you want a second opinion, you can always go to our website, PetLifeRadio.com, and I will definitely answer your questions. So thanks for listening. Have yourself a great day. Give that pet a hug. Take care. Bye-bye. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.